right, everybody, how is it going? Uh, we're here for our uh, second week here. We just wrapped up week one last week. We sort of plowed through chapter five. Uh, I think for some of us that was smooth. I think others of us had a bit of work to do. Uh, but uh, hopefully we're all relatively comfortably coming into week two here. Um, this week we have uh, two sections that we're covering. We're going to look at sections. Scroll up here. We're going to look at section 6.1 and 6.2 this week. Uh, areas between curves is going to be section 6.1. We'll knock that out today. Tomorrow we'll look at section 6.2, which is entitled simply volumes. Um, what we're going to see if you are, you know, progressing through these things this week. Uh, I think section 6.2 has a lot more work to do than section 6.1. I hope that in section 6.1 you can draw a pretty easy picture for everything and just do the math associated with your picture. In section 6.2, even if you can draw a really good picture, you're still going to have to be pretty uh, crafty with your algebra um, to come up with the appropriate steps for that. But again, um, the thing that I want to keep on stressing to you guys, and I've said it a couple times like in the notes in the weekly guide stuff, is um, Keep remembering that uh, some of our big goals are always to be able to set up integrals that are going to compute a desired quantity. Whether you can actually compute the integral or not is not actually necessarily that relevant because most integrals in the world can't be integrated. It's a, it's a classically difficult thing. Lots of stuff is not integrable. We're gonna look at a very, very important integral that can't be done uh, today. Uh, it's sort of an offhand thing, but um, remembering that constructing the appropriate integral that's relevant to the situation is really important for us here. So kind of keep in mind that last chapter and next chapter are about doing integration. This chapter and chapter eight are a lot more about saying what integral represents the scenario. Hopefully we can do the integration. If we need to go to something like Wolfram Alpha, then we have to go to something like Wolfram Alpha. Um, but it's always gonna be the case uh, for a hundred percent of your life that you know calculus will always be the case that the most interesting things you can't actually integrate um, and so it's a it's a constant battle of saying learn more techniques find more interesting stuff learn more techniques find more interesting stuff so you're always at the edge of where we don't know how to integrate what we're looking at so again this should be our easier of the two sections this week i think i think section 6.2 has, has, has a lot bigger can of worms here i think 6.1 hopefully is a pretty simple idea and i'm going to kind of get that simple idea across to you with a little analogy up front right here. So what I'm gonna actually kind of do is do a whole example of something that I teach in a different class here to help us start to think about kind of the idea associated with this section here. So in general, I like to think that there's two major types of graphical subtraction that we do uh, typically in all math classes. Um, and I wanna get a good idea of the two of those. One of the two graphical subtractions is going to be the one that's uh, associated with the areas between curves. I'm gonna talk about the other one first, just so that we get this graphical subtraction idea in our heads here. So one way that we can do graphical subtraction is we can think about horizontal subtraction. The other one would be vertical subtraction. And the number one thing I think of when I think of this horizontal subtraction is always uh, actually not something in a calculus class. I think about my statistics class that I teach. One of the hardest things about statistics is that pretty much everything in statistics is actually a calculus defined quantity. Almost every important thing in statistics comes from derivatives and integrals, but nobody has really ever typically taken calculus by the time they take a stats class. Um, and so teaching stats can be a challenge because if students ever ask like really good questions, uh, I often end up being like, uh, go take calculus and then come back and ask me and I'll be able to answer that. Like that's unfortunately my answer to lots of those questions, right? So one of the things that's unfortunate about teaching statistics is that so many things uh, in the statistical world have normal distributions. When I say normal, I mean normal with the capital N right there. That's a formal name of a distribution family, also known as a Gaussian distribution because Gauss uh, was the person who formalized this definition. We know this most generically as the bell curve, right? So the bell curve shape that you're picturing is in general defined by this terrible looking formula that you're seeing right here. Um, hopefully you can see these two little, uh, um, uh, the, the parameters that are in here where mu is the population average and sigma is the population standard deviation. 
uh, x is our individual observation and this computation here will tell us what is the probability that we will see observation x given that our normally distributed probability has an average of mu and a standard of sigma so the whole problem with this is that even if this wasn't the calculus related thing even just this equation itself is too complicated for any of my stat students and the real issue here is that we often want to ask questions like uh, so for example I often want to ask bell curve questions like what is the probability that you know so I have a son maybe I want to know what's the probability that my son is going to be shorter than like five foot six or something like this right so if we knew what the average adult male height was and we knew how uh, widely distributed those values were then we could maybe find where five foot six inches is relative to everything else on the normal curve and say what we're really interested in is all the area underneath the curve to the left of five foot six inches the area underneath any probability distribution function is one or under the whole thing because that's 100 percent of all the outcomes by the way chapter eight one of our application sections is probability functions i'm going to get all jacked up because i love talking about stats and calculus together um, but and so two things that you should realize here one you should realize that what I just did I just shaded area underneath the curve it's clearly the case that computing probabilities since a probability will always be an area underneath a probability density curve uh, it's really just an integration right it's really just an integral that we're ever doing whenever we're talking about probabilities the problem is is that none of my stat students have ever done integration right um, and by the way, real quick before we walk away from this, this is a terrible looking function that you're looking at right there. But I want you to wash away all the crap of all the constant multiples and additions and subtractions. You know that uh, adding a constant or multiplying by a constant does not affect any calculus that we do, derivatives or integrals, right? So if I strip away all the crap from that equation right there, what I really see that I have is that thing is really just like, if we wanted to get, by the way, so this guy right here should be like the integral from, you know, we're going from all the way to the left, negative infinity, all the way up to five foot six inches. Certainly I would rewrite that in terms of like just inches or something, but whatever, I'm just trying to make a picture here. And it's our, our area underneath our probability curve right there, right? Well, in general, this is going to be about equivalent to you needing to integrate this function. Now, again, I just said, all these constants don't mean anything to me, constant multiples. There's a constant multiple, it doesn't mean anything to me. Constant divisor, constant addition, subtraction, all these constants don't affect our calculus, right? So at the very least, my question to you, yeah, how tall are you, negative? I know, in this one, it should maybe go down to zero, uh, but uh, negative infinity is a good height right there, I think, as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, it, and I wrote the negative infinity on purpose because I wanna show you a picture I'm gonna draw here in a second, right? Um, so what this ultimately boils down to is the question here. Can you do that integral, right? So I've washed away all the unnecessary, oh, okay, they're necessary for the true computation, but I've washed away all of the constant addition, constant subtraction, constant multiplication, constant division, none of those affect our calculus. And the question is, can you do this integral? And the answer is, well, no, not quite. The issue with this integral here is that we sort of need some sort of u sub thing to happen, but we don't have all of our parts. If I was going to integrate this guy, I would really want to pick something like u equals x squared. But if I were to do this, then I'd be getting du is 2x dx. And that x right there, I need, and I don't have it. That's a problem for me. Uh, at the very end of this lecture, just for fun, I'm gonna show you a super sneaky roundabout that people do to make this stuff integrable here. But it's a really crafty trick. Uh, and it's really based on a Calc 3 idea, um, 50C, um, but it's worth cool seeing. It's really cool. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll show you that at the very end here, but it's not the point of today. The point of today is that the most desirable function to integrate in all of statistics is not an integrable function. That's very disappointing for us. So it turns out that lots of probabilities that we get are numerically calculated from more like true Riemann sums, just with a large N, but not truly doing the integration. So what I give to my students instead is I give them, I define this thing for them. I define this CP function for cumulative probability because I want a graphical way for my stat students to think about what's really happening here. So what I do is I ask them questions like, so in the previous one, I said, what is the probability that my son grows up to be shorter than five foot six? 
Shorter than is a one directional interview or an interview interval, right? Shorter than is just going to send us in the shorter than direction. On the other hand, if I were to say something like, what is the probability that my son is between 70 and 72 inches tall? That's a between interval, right? So it's got an upper bound and it's got a lower bound. So I encourage them to think of this CP function here because this allows us to do graphical subtraction. What I can sort of picture for myself then is, and for example, by the way, 70 inches is five foot 10 and that is average, uh, pretty close to average in the US. So 72 would be a little bit above average. But that would make sense because I am a little above average height and so is uh, at least my wife's brother, at least on the males on that side. So I would picture that 72 might be more like right here, right? Now, notice that the way that I define my cumulative probability function is, is the area up to this value. So if I ask my students to graph what I'm thinking of for CP72 in the height situation, CP72 is going to be all of this area out here and again, I know that this is the idea of integration. They don't. That's not important to them. They are just doing the graphical subtraction, right? So then I say to them, well, if we really just wanted to find the probability that I'm between 70 and 72 inches, then we should just be able to do the subtraction of the areas of these two graphs, right? Where notice this one here had its 72 is, or 70 was here, and there's 72. At this one, 70 was our average and it was actually the height of interest. What we are left with on the other end over here is the result of doing that little bit of horizontal subtraction, which is really just going to leave me with our little strip in the middle right there from 70 to 72. Right? So this is a thing I do all the time in stats of trying to say, think about the two chunks of geometry that we're subtracting from each other. This one on the left had this extra piece that the one in the middle didn't have. And so when I subtract off this one in the middle, which subtracted off this tail, and I know, and Grave Mark's sitting here in chat making fun of me for going off to negative infinity for a person's height out there, right? But in general, in our, in our theoretical normal distribution, those tails go off to infinity out there, right? So the thing that I'm picturing is we're accumulating area from negative infinity all the way up to 72. This graph is accumulating area from negative infinity all the way up to 70. And so if I subtract this area, this, the middle area off from our left area, all we're left with is the area between 70 and 72. This is actually what we're truly interested in, right? And so what I should do underneath these is kind of indicate what integral I'm actually picturing goes with these, right? This should be something like the integral from negative infinity to 72 of f of x minus the integral from negative infinity up to 70 of f of x and that should just be leaving us, oh my gosh, I should, I should try and at least be appropriate here, dx. And it does matter because we're doing left-right subtractions, so that does matter. But this should just be getting us the 70 to 72 then, f of x dx, right? So what my stat students don't know is any of that in integral stuff. You know the integral stuff, right? What I'm just trying to get our idea of here is that we are doing a geometric subtraction. I, could, I give my stat students the CP function, even though they don't have a formula for it, and I tell them I want them to draw all these pictures, even though they can't do the integration. What we know, because we're in Calc 2, is this is the stuff going on under the hood right there. Negative infinity to 72 minus negative infinity to 70 gives us the 70 to 72 chunk that's happening. The important thing here is that this was a left-right subtraction, right? We took stuff that accumulated from left to right and subtracted off a different amount that accumulated a different amount from left to right, and we were given a finite width interval that was left over right there. That's not what we're doing in this section. We've already done our bounds of integration messing around, and all it amounts to is a left-right subtraction. A different way that we could think about doing some geometric subtraction is to do some vertical subtraction. And that's really what the section 6.1 is all about. So let's draw the pictures that are equivalent to this, all right? So this is our geometric concept here. Our picture idea should be the same. How we're gonna manage it with the calculus will be different. But our picture idea of picture subtraction is really important. And man, oh man, do I want to see so many pictures that are feeling like this here. And we'll draw some of them right now. So I want to know the area between y equals x squared and y equals square root of x on the interval from 0 to 1. So some things that I know are, I know vaguely what these things look like on my interval from 0 to 1. Man, my axes are getting good here. Uh, I know that x squared looks like this. Uh, x squared from 0 to 1, I know it's going to look like this. Uh, one of the interesting things is that I know that we all like to think that squaring makes numbers bigger. 
and that square rooting makes numbers smaller. But you should remember that that's only true for numbers bigger than one. For small fractional numbers, squaring the number makes it smaller, right? One tenth of one tenth is one one hundredth. That's the square of 0.1 is 0 0.01. On the other hand, square rooting small numbers makes them larger. The square root of 1 fourth is 1 half. That's the square root of 0.25 is 0.5. So what I can see here is I can clearly see that square root of x is actually the taller function for a while, and x squared is the smaller function, and actually is over the entire interval right here. Right? So what I'm thinking is because the square root of x function is the taller of the two functions, this is going to be my first graph. So here I'm going to draw my square root function up to 1. I'm going to go up to 1 here. And I know that I'm looking at all this area. There's my area underneath square root. I can subtract off all the area underneath square root of x up to 1. And what that's going to go ahead and leave me with. And I, I guess I should integral from 0 to 1 root x dx minus the integral from 0 to 1 x squared dx is going to be leaving me here with, and now I can draw both curves. All right, so now we've got x squared, we've got root x, and now what I should have left over when I subtract them is just going to be the area that's in between them. All, right? all we've got left is that little piece that's in there. I started with all of this area, but we can see now that like this region right here, we wanted it to be the only region that got kept. So we chopped off all the area that was underneath x squared by a subtraction, and we're left with only this sliver that's sitting right here. Right? So we should notice that what we did is we just did the difference of two integrals. Right, So the nice thing that's happening here is we literally just have to be doing some slightly careful subtraction and that's the only concept of this entire section is do subtraction carefully. That's all we got to know for this whole section here. So let's do this, but let's immediately look at some technicalities. I'm obviously assuming you guys have read the section and seen these very basic ideas right here that we can subtract these two integrals right here or ultimately, I don't know, I guess I should write this uh, over here. I wrote my x squared in bad spot right there. Um, it looks like what we should be doing is our integral uh, from 0 to 1. In this case, root x minus x squared dx. The only thing that we've got to be careful with here is that subtraction order matters. And it matters that we pick square root of x first. And the only reason is, is because that is the top to bottom. The final thing I want to do before I go move on with this problem is I want to think about my Riemann block here. Notice here, if I draw my Riemann stick or my Riemann rectangle or my Riemann block, I'm seeing here it's going to have that infinitely narrow width. Let me draw it over here. Right? I know that this width here is going to be that delta x or our dx term. I know that the top of my rectangle is always at a height of square root of x. And I notice that the bottom of my rectangle is always at a height of x squared. Those heights are going to change based on what x is, but we're going to accumulate all of these over all x values from 0 to 1. So notice here that this actual height itself is square root of x minus x squared. We always do top to bottom, right to left, final minus initial, right? So it matters that we track which function is on top. If you're just given two random functions and I want to know what's the area between them, you sort of have to stop for a minute and figure out which one is on top or else you don't know what order to set your subtraction up in. So the order does matter for the subtraction. It's always got to be top minus bottom for us to get our, our accumulated area here. So this is the not very exciting one. What I want to do is I want to make this problem slightly more exciting by extending our bound out to x equals 4. Yes, all right, it didn't attach itself. So the important thing here is I'm still looking at these same functions, x squared and root x, but instead now I'd like to go out to x equals 4, and we need to be now a little bit more careful with what we set up. And then we'll actually do the problem here. I just built my integral, and I'm walking away. But I've been yelling at you guys. Chapter 6 and Chapter 8, I definitely care more that you can build the integral than that you can do the integral. I definitely want you to be able to do the integral, but if I had to pick one, I'd rather that you can 
build it than that you can, can uh, evaluate it. So just even coming up with that statement is, is the key part to this here. So let's go ahead and see what happens when we extend our other boundary line here, right? So now we're gonna go out to x equals four. So we're in the first quadrant, we've got our two bounding curves, but now we've, we're going out to x equals four. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a much bigger picture for this one. I think that's not a terrible picture right there. Okay, uh, that looks pretty good. There we go. I'm pretty happy with myself right here. Uh, this is a little disproportionate, but I think you guys are going to be able to totally read what I got going on here, right? So we've got our y equals x squared up here. We've got our y equals square root of x down here. And the important thing that's happening here is that if I want to measure the area that's between them, I certainly got my line x equals 4 right here. What I'm looking to accumulate is all of the area in this piece, as well as all of the area in this piece. The only big change that's happened from the previous problem is that in the previous problem, we only dealt with this piece over here, where the square root function was on top and the square, and the square function was on bottom. But what you guys know is that there's eventually going to be a switch, right? Notice that after whatever this special, special point is that we clearly need to know exactly where that location is, it looks like they switch. And now x squared is on top and square root is on bottom down here. So what I kind of like to do is I kind of like to break up my, my regions here. I need to know where does that happen. And I'd like to name my two regions just to do some organizational type things here. So I know that you guys all just know where that point is. And if you don't, you should just stop and think about it for a second and shouldn't do math. But if you do need to do math, then what I could do is I could set these two equations equal to each other and solve. Uh, if I'm solving this, I guess I would square both sides, right? Uh, x to the fourth equals x. I squared both sides, so I might've introduced some extraneous solutions. So I gotta be careful here. Uh, I can subtract over x to the fourth minus x equals zero. I'm going to get x uh, cubed minus one uh, as the interior part. It looks like we're going to get x equals zero and one. Uh, there's my intersection at zero, zero. So this must be at the location x equals one right there. Finally, notice that if you plug in one into either of these functions, we certainly get back one. So it looks like this is located at one, one that point. So I know that my boundaries of interest now are at zero, one, and four. So as promised, my graph is a little not proportional here. You should try and draw better graphs than me than where one is the same distance as four, or rather that's a distance of three, that's a distance of one, they look the same. But uh, we're being generic here, I'm trying to do my best, right? So um, I'm gonna just call this region A, and I'm gonna just call this region B just so that we have names for these things. Totally arbitrary, I'm just making some stuff up, but it's just good for like, you wanna be able to talk about something. You should be able to say, what do we do for region A? What do we do for region B? Um, and so it looks to me like in region A, uh, it looks like, oh, by the way, I wanna do one other thing right here. And I wanna go ahead and name these two curves something else. Let's call our squared function y1, and let's call our square root function y2. I, again, I just want names that are going to be associated with some of these things here. It's pretty helpful for me typically to name these things. So uh, what I've done is I've graphed things. I have found where our function has breakdowns. Where do we switch which functions on top and bottom? And I've named all of my sub intervals on the x-axis of interest as A, B, and however many I need, however many times it flips which one's on top, I'm going to keep breaking it down. <clears throat> so it looks like now, I can set up my statements here. It looks like our total area is going to be, the first thing I want to do is I want to look at region A's area. I guess I'm just going to say it like this. It's going to be the area associated with region A plus the area associated with region B. In this case, it looks like that area is going to be region A is going to be the integral from 0 to 1. In region A, I have that the y2 function is on top and I have the y1 function is on bottom y2 is the square root there, right? And that's going to be accumulated for each of the x values from 0 to 1. I also want to accumulate the area that goes from 1 to 4. In the x interval from 1 to 4, the upper function is actually y1. It's the squared function. So here we'll do our y1 minus y2. 
since we flipped which was on top and what was on bottom we had to rip this apart into a couple different regions out there to find our total area now we can go ahead i think and evaluate this integral and what we didn't do last time was actually evaluate it so now i guess we can here uh, can i just do this yeah i just want to do that okay so let's go ahead and actually evaluate these guys here um, in this case this should have been uh, integral from 0 to 1. In our first one, the upper bound was our square root function, square root of x minus x squared dx. Over here, we're going to get integral from 1 to 4. Uh, and there's switch. The x squared was on top here, and the square root was on bottom. Um, so, doing a little bit of integration. I know that I really should be thinking about square root as uh, x to the 1 half. So, I'm going to add 1 to the power. So, it's going to become an x to the 3 halves. I want the to when I take the derivative I want to just get back to my original so I want this three halves to cancel with a two-thirds sitting out front so that we just get a coefficient of one like we had before similarly I'm assuming you guys have all taken the integral of x squared enough times by now to just be able to write it and we're integrating this guy from x equals zero to x equals one hopefully you guys all learned your u sub lesson always write your variable of integration here we're getting pretty similar stuff over here just clip this up. We're going to get our one third x cubed minus two thirds x to the three halves. And this will be evaluated from x equals one to x equals four. So let's go ahead and do our, our integration here and we'll be good with this previous problem. Again, the big part of the setup here, the big part is that we can identify the locations of interest on our graph and write the integrals that represent uh, what we're really trying to do. I would say that like there's definitely going to be a question on our first test where that is going to be your final answer, right? Where I'm just going to say state the integral expression that gives the area underneath this curve make sure that the integral or integrals in your expression are in terms of dx or something like that and that might be a final question final answer to a test question and in this case we should do it out here uh, so one thing i'm noticing first of all is that this x equals zero is going to be nothing here i want to do my my f of one minus f of zero but again f of zero here is going to go to zero uh, so I just need f of one f of one just means plug in ones for the x's so i'm really just going to get in this chunk two-thirds minus one-third and so it looks like we're going to get one-third is the area that we accumulated in that first uh, little sliver that should have been our answer to the previous question by the way and our second chunk over here we got a little bit of work to do with this one um, it looks like I can do uh, let's see here we got a one-third four cubed minus two-thirds of four to the three halves minus one-third minus two-thirds because that's where we're at at one uh four cubes 64 thirds right four times four is 16 times four is 64 minus square root of four is two two cubed is eight eight times two is 16 thirds minus negative a third so in total i think that i have here there's one third and 64 makes 65 55 49 plus one i think i'm getting 50 thirds is my total answer here isn't it crazy that you end up getting such nice answers such nice fractional answers from doing integrals of weird fractional powers and all that stuff out there works out very nicely here so as long as I did my computation right here at the end I've noticed that I think the last three problems I've tried to evaluate I've screwed up the last steps right there but whatever uh, as I've said to you guys man this is what I expect you to be able to do the most this step is what I expect you to be able to do the second most and this step is what I expect you to be able to do the third most down there right if this is the step you screw up this is the part I care the least about setting up the integrals I care the most, evaluating the, in, doing the integration I care the second most, doing your arithmetic I care the, the least most right there. Um, so building these is, is the important part. So again, I just want to say like before we walk away from this right here, drawing these pictures matters, like picturing for yourself, naming some functions, identifying where we experience change of which function is on top and bottom. These are all the really key parts of this. So realize that this is a super visual section here and we want to be able to draw these pictures and interpret the visuals uh, that are associated with these. 
Um, and again, uh, in these, notice that there were still Riemann sticks that we were considering here. I still was picturing a Riemann stick here that had a width of dx, a uh, upper bound height of square root of x, a lower bound height of x squared. And similarly, there was one representative Riemann stick for this region as well, one stick per region. In this region, the height is measured differently. We had to flip our subtraction to appropriately measure the height of the Riemann stick, and that's why we flipped the integrand over that subtraction right there. Right? So I think even this one, even with us having two different regions that we have to consider, is a generally pretty simple thing to do right here. We just got to remember final minus initial. And if which one is in front changes, then we need to correspondingly change our subtraction to go with it. Um, so when I referred to these as vertical and horizontal subtraction, those were kind of bad names. Those would be good names if everything we did was like a y equals function and if every integral we did was an integral dx. Um, so those aren't super good names. Those are good names for our standard use scenarios, but not for everything, right? Um, let's look at some where we might benefit from doing our subtractions other ways, setting up our integrals both ways. Um, so I will say, in the interest of, I think, 6.1 being much simpler than 6.2, um, I am going to spend kind of a lot of time on this problem, but this is really the last thing I was intending to do here for this 6.1 day. Um, but this is a bit of a hairier one right here. So this is number four in the homework section uh, for 6.1 here. Um, and so what we want to do is, uh, we are going to do this one both ways. We're going to do this one with vertical Riemann sticks. And we'll at least set this guy up, I should say, both ways with vertical and horizontal Riemann sticks. We might not do it both ways, but we'll at least get both integral uh, statements set up. Um, so here we would like to find the area of the region that is bounded by each of these given quadratics right here. So uh, I have graphed this. Let me just move all this onto its own page here. So I graphed this guy in Desmos, and this should really be your first step. And in fact, we should just be able to pop over to Desmos here and take a look at this guy. I've already got it in here. Um, this is such a graphical section. You should really be heavily relying on graphs. The only thing I want you to do to not overstep your graph reliance is you should immediately see if there's some intersections of this graph that might be of interest to us to know where they're located for this problem. You should make sure that if you're finding uh, intersections of two curves that you do your best to make all of that be exact. In this graph right here, we're going to notice that the points of intersection are very nice. Obviously, it's a textbook problem. If those were some crappier decimals, I would expect you to go do the by hand math and tell me it's like, oh, their square root of eight is the x value right there and use that value. So like if Desmos is giving you decimals, don't necessarily just use those decimals. Um, but you know, use Desmos, help, help it get a picture here. So the area of interest is this weird little blob that's going to be sitting in between these two graphs right here. So what we want to think to ourselves is how can we smartly do integration uh, to come up with this area right here. It's clearly going to be between two curves. So we know it's going to be its area. So it's integration. It's between two curves. So there's going to be an, a subtraction. We just need to decide what subtraction and over what values, right? So let's go ahead and back over to our, our actual problem here in Word. So um, sitting back over here, uh, what I'm thinking to myself is, and we want to look at these pictures here, is let's see what this would look like if we tried to draw some Riemann sticks associated with each of our scenarios here. So notice if I build vertical Riemann sticks, any vertical Riemann stick is always going to have a dx or a delta x as its width. Any horizontal Riemann stick is always going to have a change in y as a thickness right there, a dy, right? So this would be our dy integral that we'd set up over here. This will be our dx integral that we'll set up over here. Uh, another thing I've done to help make this slightly nicer for ourselves is this isn't even actually doable if you don't even know which of the curves is which for the equation. We have to know that information or we can't do this problem. So I did label these uh, telling you which one is the red one, which one's the blue one, or if any of us have any issues with the red and blue coloration here. I don't know if this is really visible. I don't know if all of you or none of you are colorblind. Uh, upper right meaning this little leg right here is what I'm picturing in the upper right. That's our red one the first function. Lower left, I'm picturing the lower left leg down here to be our blue function or second function right there. So let's see what this would look like right here. So what I'm picturing for myself is I'm picturing just dragging a Riemann stick across this thing, a vertical Riemann stick. 
So the first thing that I'm seeing for myself is if I'm going to do all this stuff with vertical Riemann sticks, what I need to recognize is that my vertical, or sorry, my, my horizontal span of boundaries that we need to experience, what X values are we gonna experience? It looks like our X values are gonna go from negative four all the way up to positive one. This is going to be my overall span of X values over which I'm going to accumulate vertical Riemann sticks. But here's my issue right away. If I start thinking about what my uh, Riemann sticks are gonna look like, I'm noticing that this Riemann stick right here, its height depends only on knowing what that red parabola's heights are. However, once I cross over this special point of intersection right there, which by the way, Desmos is helping tell us that that's a very clean 0.33 right there, our Riemann stick just changed, right? We're not measuring height the same way of our representative sticks once we go past this subdivision at negative three right here. So I'm gonna break that down right there. Negative three is apparently a place where we're gonna change the way that we do this. Now, once we pass that point, we're gonna get a different looking Riemann stick here, where now my Riemann stick has a upper bound of the upper half of the blue. It has a lower bound of the lower half of the red. And we could keep sliding this Riemann stick across the curves, but what you should notice is that eventually we're gonna to get to another important change. Once we hit zero, zero, this is no longer a good representative Riemann stick because our lower bound height will no longer be the bottom of the red curve once we pass x equals zero. So it also matters in this case that we have another breakdown at zero and that we recognize that this Riemann curve right here, or sorry, this Riemann stick right here is going to have both an upper and lower bound that are both only based on the blue function, right? So notice here, we've really broken this guy up into three different regions, A, B, and C, where we have described one generic Riemann stick for each of those three regions. And again, notice the most important thing to notice here is that these Riemann sticks have heights that are calculated different ways. All of the widths of these Riemann sticks we're just gonna call dx. This height goes from top of red to bottom of red. This goes from top of blue to bottom of red. This goes from top of blue to bottom of blue. The heights are measured differently in all three cases here. This isn't even our biggest issue to deal with this one, but let's kind of walk away. Let, let's stop for a second here and move on over to our example on the other side before we build our integration statements. Notice in this case here, we're looking to build horizontal Riemann sticks for our alternate case. Notice because I'm building horizontal Riemann sticks, I immediately recognize that in a horizontal Riemann stick case, I'm gonna to want to drag a horizontal stick top to bottom to accumulate all of our area. We're taking a one dimensional horizontal stick and moving it up or down to accumulate all of our area as opposed to a vertical stick that we slide left and right to accumulate our area. So I know here that for this dy integral, it looks like our y boundaries should go from zero to three. That should be the overall bounds on our earliest to latest integral, even if we have several, right? Over here, we're gonna get an integral from negative four to negative three, then from negative three to zero, then from zero to one. So the overall boundary goes from negative four to one, but there was some subdivisions. Here, I know that even if there's subdivisions, the overall boundary is gonna to go to zero to three. So now I ask myself, what do these Riemann sticks look like? Well, I can start to draw my first Riemann stick right here. Here's my first Riemann stick. This Riemann stick, as described, is gonna have a height of dy. It's gonna have a width where the final width is the blue part and the early width is the red part. The great news is that I can just use this one stick. I only need one stick. Uh, now that I think about it, the only one tiny weird thing that I did right here is technically, I guess I like to think like if I did the X values from left to right, I probably should have done the Y values from bottom to top. So the only thing I did maybe very slightly weird here is I probably should have drawn this guy right here um, from uh, zero as my height down here to go up to three, right? To kind of indicate that it's down here. Uh, coffee gopher, what's that? Were you negative three to... Th uh, Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> your good call right there. That's going to matter there in a second, that that's a negative three right there. Thank you for the typo. Um, so in general, though, the good, the good thing to notice is that you should identify that this Riemann stick is the same for this entire vertical span from zero to three. 
the left bound is always going to be the red curve the right bound is always going to be the blue curve so we never change which function is top and bottom right or in this case left and right the relationship between the two curves stays the same the entire span of time that right away is hugely enough information for me to be able to say clearly this is the one i think we should pick we don't have to keep on drawing separate riemann sticks that are different from each other for each of our sub intervals but again we always want to see bad examples because they're what help teach us to do the good things right so we're still going to walk out both of these here but hopefully already you're convinced that our second setup here is better than our first setup here so i guess what i should say is this is just one single region. I guess I'm just going to call it region D just so that we don't have any region confusion here. But the important thing here is that we found that we can use one single representative Riemann stick here because when we go vertically, the bounds from left to right never change. If we try and instead accumulate things horizontally, what's on top and bottom will change over that horizontal span, making us have to do more work. Every time something changes, we got to stop and think. We're trying to do less of that, right? So let's see if we can set up some of the integrals now that are associated with this. So what I guess I want to say over here is, I, I, here's the way I guess I feel like I should be writing this. Oh man, I even have some more work to do before I can go ahead and do this. We're going to see that in a second. Now, here's the next thing I'm going to see. So I'm trying to say that these should be equal to each other, right? Whatever we get on the far end should be the same as each other. One of these ways is just going to be easier and one's going to be harder. This is clearly the easy way. Maybe let's make this statement first. It looks like in this statement over here, we are, we know that we're going to accumulate our area. Uh, we know that all of our Riemann sticks are all going to have a vertical thickness of dy they're all going to have a horizontal width of the rightmost minus the leftmost. In this case here, the rightmost function is the blue one. The leftmost function is the red one. And so I'm even just going to say, uh, well, okay, sorry. I, I do want to say something here. We are trying to do y stuff times our x stuff, right? That's always our, our situation here. Area is length times width, x times y, right? So I'm noticing here that I do want this to be my x stuff. So this had better be my x equations in here. And so I think I can say here the blue one is the upper one. So that's going to be my x equals 2y minus y squared. Here's what I really should do. I'm going to call this xr and I'm going to call this xb. And so we've got xr and we've got xb and we've got xb. And we've got XR. Okay. Uh, so it looks like what we're really trying to do here is blue minus red, right? Blue is the upper bound on the X axis. Red is the lower bound on the X axis right here. So it looks like what I want to do is X blue minus X red. I'm doing this uh, across all of the Y values from zero to three. Since this is a dy integral, I know that I want my definite integral bounds to be y values. So the y values went from 0 to 3 there. Um, so in this case, man, I'm going to need to give myself kind of a lot more room here because the other one's going to get gross. Uh, in this case here, I can subtract my two equations. So xb is 2y my, two my minus y squared. Let me get a 2y minus y squared minus and our other equation 2y minus y squared was the blue y squared minus 4y is the red y squared minus 4y dy so this is going to be pretty easy to integrate we're just integrating a polynomial now let's see if i can just do this in two lines here uh, this should be so i'm noticing a couple things one negative y squared and negative y squared oh man all right i might need to do an algebra line here negative 2y squared, um, I am getting, I have 2y plus 4y is going to give me a 6y dy. I can do the integration. This should be giving me negative 2 thirds y cubed plus y. We'll go to y squared. So we want the division by 2 associated with this. 3y squared. And we're evaluating this all from y equals 0 to y equals 3. 
So it should be the case that when we evaluate at zero, it just goes to zero. So I should be getting negative two thirds times three cubed plus three times three squared. So here, three times or three cubed is 27. Two thirds of 27 is negative 18. And this is really just three cubed here, right? So that's 27. So I'm getting our answer to just be nine. That's, I guess, what I'm expecting to get for our other parts over here, right? So again, I am very convinced that this is the simpler of the two ways. You're gonna be even more convinced of that in a second right here. We stopped and we drew a picture. In fact, we drew two pictures. We compared our comparable Riemann sticks and, this, and the integrals that we think they're gonna be associated with. This guy had one Riemann stick for the whole thing. This needs three representative Riemann sticks, so we chose this to be easier. Since our Riemann sticks were, had a thickness, a height of dy, we knew that we wanted y bounds on our integral. We knew that we had to have y stuff times x stuff in the integral. So I did give x equals equations. What was x? x is 2y minus square, y squared. x is y squared minus 4y. Right? Um, doing this integral is very easy because these are just polynomials. We evaluated this at 3 and 0. At 0, it went to 0 because it's a polynomial. So all I have to do is plug in 3, right? Relatively easy. Let's see how this kind of goes to hell when we try and do all of our X stuff over here. So what I need now is uh, it's kind of a problem for me, right? I guess what I need here is I need to start setting up some integrals here. So this one's going to be the one that goes from negative 4 to negative 3. And it's going to be, like, I don't even know what I need here. Like, I know this is going to be a DX integral, but, like, what's my Y stuff? I guess I need to figure that out. I guess I'm just going to write these like this real quick. Or excuse me, sorry, this is my x. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 that's what I made a mistake of. These are dx. These are the, the width of these is delta x. So it's a dx. I need a height to go with that dx. That's a dx right there. And plus the integral from 0 to 1 of our y stuff dx. Now notice, here's my big issue. I don't have equations that say y equals for these things. That's kind of a really big bummer for me right here. So I need to go do some solving. So now check out our next annoying step right here. I need to be able to solve each of these equations so that they look like y equals equations so that I can put my y stuff inside of my integrands here. So I'm going to show you the two different ways that I do this. And again, I know that I'm doing the long form work right here. Uh, which algebra step are you looking for there, Grave? Just give me more specifics and I'll, and I'll answer that. I'm going to start busting out this algebra right here because it's kind of a bummer. So x equals y squared minus 4y. I need to solve this guy for y. All right, so here's one way that we can do this. One way I can do this is I can complete the square on this guy. That's a minus right there complete the square, I can say negative 4 divided by 2 squared. Negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2. Squared is 4. So 4 is really what I'd like in our special spot right there. y squared minus 4y plus 4 is what I really wanted. Since I brought in a 4, I'll eliminate the 4. The x is along for the ride. Those terms there group up to give me y minus 2 squared minus 4 minus x equals 0. I can add 4 and add x to the other side, take a square root, and add a 2. I'm just going to do all these as one last step here. Oh, yeah, totally. I'll go back to that. And so as I'm talking about algebra, let me talk about this one real quick. Here, I first I added the 4 and the x to the other side, so they both became positive. Next up, I took a square root, and I know I have to introduce this plus or minus. This gives me the top half and the bottom half of these sideways parabolas. Finally, I add this 2 over to the other side, and I now have a y equation, and this is for my uh, red curve. So this is my red upper and my red lower. Let me get some breakdowns here. I'm getting a lot of stuff on my screen here. So... Real quick, I'm going to bounce back over. Grave was just asking how I did my quick mental math over here. 
basically what I'm looking at is over here, I noticed that I only had y or squared terms and single power of y terms. So I know I'm just combining some like terms with those guys. A and the other thing I'm doing is I'm distributing the negative in my head. So negative one y squared, when I distribute this negative, I get a second negative y squared. That's two negative y squareds. The second thing that I did is a positive two y subtracting negative 4y, distributing this negative gave me a positive 4y for a grand total of 6y. When I'm doing the integral step here, I always ignore my constant multiple out front. So I'm ignoring the fact that this is a negative 2 right here. I know that when I integrate any uh, power rule, the power is always going to increase by 1, so 2 goes up to 3. I also know that when I take my derivative, I want to arrive back at the same constant multiple. Since the derivative of this would pop out a constant multiple of three, I want there to be now a one-third that's gonna help me cancel that away. So I introduced a one-third to go with the constant multiple that was already there of negative two. And now when I take this derivative, I get back this same part right there. Same thing for the six y, power is one. I add one to the power to make it two. But then I think to myself, whatever this constant multiple is, I know I'm going to get two times that much when I take the derivative. So I wanted to introduce a one half. So this three, I really think of this as six over two. The six remained. I introduced a one half to match the power of two. And that helps keep everything aligned. So every time I do integration, I always do the derivative right back immediately to kind of help me match up this constant coefficients. So back to more algebra. The other thing we need to do is we need to unfortunately solve this other equation for y as well. I'm going to just do it a different way just so that you can see two different ways. Here I have now solved what I think was what I called my red equation. Now let's do the blue equation. x equals 2y my, two my minus y squared. So we got x equals 2y minus y squared. The other way that you can solve these equations for y is to use the quadratic formula. I'm going to move terms around until I have a positive y squared y squared minus 2y plus x equals 0. And it looks, in this case, looks like I have an a of 1, a b is negative 2, and my c is x. So I can just fill out the quadratic formula, and it will give me a y equals statement here. So I've got a y equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4 times a doesn't matter, times c, which is x, all over 2a. I'm real quick noticing that this 4 underneath the square root can be just as good as a 2 outside the square root. So I'm getting here 1 plus or minus 1 minus x as my statement right there. I factored out a 4 from the uh, square root. It came to the outside of the square root as a 2. And then there was a 2, a 2, and a 2, and I canceled them all right there. So I think this should be my good uh, expression for the, and again, let me make sure my colors match. Blue was the 2y minus y squared. So this is my blue stuff. So this was my blue, and this was my red, just to keep track of it. Okay, so I think we can finally set up some terrible integral statements now. So just stick with me, because this is going to look horrible, but we've found the information we need to get there. All right. Let me come down here because I knew I was going to want this. I copied another picture of my graph so I can snag it here. I knew this was going to be this crappy. All right. So, so here we go. Are you guys ready? And again, you shouldn't do this. If you get the choice, you should pick the other direction. Going this direction in this problem is a bad choice, but it's a choice. So you don't have to pick it. On the other hand, hopefully you understand there's obviously scenarios you can come up against where you don't get a choice and the only option is going to be like this. So like we should be able to do this, but also hopefully you're good at identifying what's going to be your smart decision and avoiding doing in this case, this part of it right here. But it's good to do the hard stuff because if you can do this, then you're going to be good to go with everything, right? So again, we, we broke this thing down and we now have some integrals. So it looks like our first region here, and I want to just rewrite my regions is all I think. A, B, C. What we had in our A region is it looks like the A region here should be, let's get back to this statement, area equals A plus B 
plus C. Our A region's area is going to be the integral from negative 4 to negative 3 of our A stuff. And here what I'm noticing is this. What I want this area to be is I want this to be a D, uh, dy, right? Because this is dy, I need this stuff, or excuse me, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is our dx stuff. We're doing our vertical our vertical bars right here. We've got all of our, in, our, our vertical uh, Riemann sticks. That Riemann stick has a width of delta x or dx. It has a height of upper red to lower red. So I'm just going to say that. Red, how, how about this? Red upper minus red lower. The upper half of the red parabola minus the lower half of the red parabola. Our B integral is going to look at the x values from negative 3 to 0. It's got upper blue, upper half of blue, minus lower half of red. See how this is awesome right now? Isn't this just great? So it looks like this is blue upper minus red lower because the upper half of the blue curve it's going to be the positive square root minus the lower half of the red curve it's going to be the negative on the square root dx finally c looks like it should be zero to one on c we have upper blue minus lower blue Whew. Okay, now let's just write this in terms of x and stop. I just want to write one more line so we can laugh about how silly this is. Uh, and, then, and then we'll call it good because I don't want to actually do this integral right here. So what we have found, and again, this is a question where like, I really might ask you to do this because it matters that we can think about construction of integrals. If the, if the integral to do is heinous, then don't do it. But um, we should be able to build these. The upper red curve should be the positive square root associated with this graph. So it should be root 4 plus x plus 2. That's upper red. The lower red will be negative root 4x plus uh, x plus 2. So I'm going to get upper red is positive root 4 plus x plus 2. minus negative root 4 plus x plus 2, right? Because my red upper and my red lower were the top half, the positive version of this, and the bottom half, the negative version of this. When we got the plus or minus, that was giving us top half of the sideways parabola, bottom half of the sideways parabola right there. Right? Whew, okay, that's dx. Our second one here, negative 3 to 0. This should be the upper half of the blue parabola, so the positive root part on the blue parabola, the positive leg of the blue one, so 1 plus square root of 1 minus x. Minus the lower red, and the lower red I'm just going to snag from a previous integral here. It should be the negative of root 4x plus 2 plus 2. or 4 plus x plus 2. I think I keep saying 4x plus something. Okay. And finally, we're adding on, finally, also the area from 0 to 1. We've got our blue upper. That should be this guy right here. The blue lower, that plus sign is just going to switch to a minus sign. So 1 plus root 1 minus x minus root 1, or 1 minus root 1 minus x. And that's all dx right there. <sighs> Oh my gosh. So we did it and we can do it and I probably will make you do it. But the point is only to set it up. Like I don't even care about us finishing evaluating right here, right? We should be able to get out our calculus beating sticks and force this stuff to be in alternate scenarios right here. We should be smart. We should keep track of values. We should do all the algebra that we need to do. We should stay organized. We should remember that we all know how to complete the square. We should remember that we all know the quadratic formula and that essentially those two things are equal to each other if you're trying to solve a quadratic. We should remember that we understand plus or minuses and what they do for us graphically in our graphs. We've got to understand our Riemann sticks here. I think that the, the most important part of this section is like this screenshot right here, right? Building your vertical versus building your horizontal 
Riemann sticks is going to give you a super good idea of the integrability of the things that you're doing. It turns out that with some pretty easy use of, we could totally do the rest of this problem that's down there. We can evaluate that integral by hand, um, but it's gross and it's terrible and uh, I don't want to, right? Doing the D routes instead of the ABC routes was clearly smooth and clean. And I should just say again, does this not shock you that we are getting literally integers for the area between sideways parabolas? That's pretty wild, is it not? Um, pretty weird right there. So as our concluding statements here, it matters that you make str smart strategic choices for yourself. A big, big mistake for any Calc 2, Calc 3 differential equation student is to just start doing math all the time. You really want there to always be a strategizing component to literally everything you do for the rest of your mathematical career. Five minutes of planning is going to clearly save you much more than five minutes of work. Look at it right here. This is way more than five minutes of work that could be saved by you doing the five minutes of planning, which is these two graphs right here. Do the planning. It's going to save you an immense amount of time when you're beating your head against the wall trying to do integration that's either difficult or impossible planning matters strategy matters um and so that's why doing lots of homework problems matters is because we want to develop intuitive senses for strategies here um rather than trying to come up with a bunch of like because what we don't want to do is come up with a list of 100 checklist rule to see what's going to happen here as far as like oh i can prove to you this is going to be the easier way because checklist numbers six, seven, and 12 told me so. Like that's not a route we wanna go either. We don't wanna formalize this too much because uh, too many rules are impossible to memorize. So it matters that we get practice uh, of developing intuition about strategizing here, I think is really key. So keep on thinking Riemann sticks here and keep thinking smart Riemann sticks. Like the whole point of this is do yourself favors. Um, and again, I'll keep saying to you like, I guarantee that I'm going to ask you like test questions that say state the integral or integrals that represent the desired area, both in DX and in DY. The reason I'm asking to do that is so that you can see the highlight of the difference in ease between the two routes of computation. Um, and so it's good that we do both. Like I want you to be able to pick, but you should be able to set up both routes all the time either way. And I think that this is a pretty good representative problem. Um, and this week, I still haven't posted the written homework, but for the written homework, I'm essentially going to ask you this one. Uh, good question. I think that those My Open Math homework questions, yeah, are going to be, yeah, pretty similar right there to the book ones. Or at least I should say, you know, uh, the more important question might be, are they going to be similar in difficulty to the test questions that I'm going to ask you? And I think that the answer right there is yes. I'm definitely trying to pick out ones that I expect that that's something you can do. Uh, it's very often the case that I really like to assign homework problems that are like 90% about something you know and what you've seen and 10% are not because it's really nice for you to stop and be like, wait a minute, but I don't know what to do about this right here. That's sort of the point of education is for you to stop and have that moment on your own. Uh, and one of the other things is that it's totally the case that, uh, you know, that represents to me your little writing activity for the week. If it, what was the muddiest point, you'd be like, well, something came up with one of these problems that I hadn't even seen before. Maybe we covered it, maybe we didn't, but I had to figure out that so-and-so meant that I should be doing this. So I do kind of like every once in a while to stick in some things that are a little bit more than what you've seen before, um, but not, you know, obviously I don't want to just beat you over the head with brand new stuff, um, but it's nice to be able to like extend the concept. Um, yeah. So yeah, I do think those are comparable to things that you should expect to see on other assessment later. Yeah. And they do seem comparable to the book. Um, and I can also tell you guys that like when I am hunting through the my open math problems to look for homework problems, I'll even see that because like in a sense, I'm just snagging these from like random people that have made available the problems they've created. But a lot of them will put like parentheses next to them and it will say something like Stuart section 6.1. So I can easily tell if they're like using the same book and like making problems that are intended to match the same section kind of thing. So that also helps with that. So. Um, so the, uh, my last takeaway here is to say, don't just think that uh, DX integrals are easy and DY integrals are hard. We can see in this case right here, the DY integrals were the easy ones, the DX was the hard. It just depends on the orientation of these shapes that you're looking at and the, the, the nature of the way that you've been given these equations because uh, notice 
Like the book, instead of giving us x equals equations, could have given us these y equal equations instead. In this case, this problem might have actually lent itself better to the other direction that we could have done this, right? The left stuff instead of the right hand stuff here. So, so just keep on thinking strategy for these problems. Try to not do math the first 60 seconds of every math problem. Try to think, conceptualize, draw pictures, and strategize, then begin your doing. Um, the lesson that you will learn in this class is that integration is expensive as far as time and mental effort goes. And so you want to be sure that you should be doing all the integration that you think that you need to be doing. Right? So let me say some concluding statements here. And then I'm just going to run back to that one integral I talked about before and we'll call it a, a lecture here. Finally, I just want to say the book states their kind of formal statement as the area between two curves as an absolute value statement. And the reason why this statement makes sense is because our subtraction is just flipping ordering, right? That's the only thing that's happening. I kind of like to think that this is just one of those formal statements where the formal statement with absolute values is just not as useful to me as the conceptual statement. Make sure you're always subtracting off the bottom uh, curve from the top curve or the left curve from the right curve. Every time they switch orderings, you need to build up a new integral that corresponds to that switching of orderings of top and bottom or of left and right. Um, so if you just remember top from bottom, right from left, final from initial, that's the order that we do subtraction in life, then you'll be fine. It's always going to be your algebraic job to determine when did we get that switch out there. So it really often helps to find Desmos to tell you, do I even need to look? And if I do, remember to solve for those things algebraically out there. But uh, hopefully we can kind of just see it's like every time they switch top and bottom or every time they switch left and right, you need to re-break down into a new uh, integral uh, that's got the bounds that are associated with that. Make sure that your Riemann stick measurements correspond with the integrals that you're writing. Um, so I'm just going to go with one. This is just a little like cool calculus thing that happened. This is in a sense more of like a preview for Math 50C. But I do want to show you a sneaky little thing that's associated with that probability statement that we made earlier this semester. Uh, or earlier this uh, this lecture and what we'll kind of see a, a, a smidge of later. So earlier what we were saying was that in statistics we often want to find the probability associated with an event with a normal curve. Um, and what this ultimately amounts to is our ability to do an integral uh, of this form. There's some other parts to this integral, but whatever. If, if we could do this, then we could do the other one. And we can't do the other one because we can't do this right here. So here's the neat little nifty thing that happens. What you're going to do in all of your Calc 3 is you're going to just step up all the things that you know in Calc 1 into being multidimensional. So what's going to happen in Calc 3 is you might go to talk about some probability distribution curves. This is my terrible, terrible, terrible drawing. Uh, this intended to be something more that like, I don't know, it goes up this way and goes down over this way. This is supposed to be a 3D drawing of more like a mound, right? Picture this object being rotated around this axis to make a 3D object. You could consider not just a normal curve, but maybe a normal surface, right? That's a three-dimensional shape. That's equivalent to this two-dimensional shape, just a re revolution of that, right? Well, what you're going to see in Calc 3 is that we can come up with probabilities for this guy. So this would be like saying, not only is my height normally distributed, but suppose that weight is also normally distributed. Now I can ask questions like, not only do I want to know the probability that I'm between 70 and 72 inches, but also between 200 and 220 pounds. That is now two normally distributed variables. I have a bivariate distribution, and I could look at a multiple integral to accumulate that area, right? We could just sum up the area that we see underneath two of these curves out here, and I could integrate under the negative x squared minus y squared dx dy. This is just me expanding, sorry, let me write that so it looks normal right there, dx dy. This is me just expanding our two-dimensional integration idea to saying first add up that sheet right there. This is the two-dimensional area on the inter inner integral. The outer integral will say then up, add up all those sheets to get a total volume. All right? So this is just our two-dimensional or three-dimensional volume instead of a two-dimensional area. Our problem is this. We still can't integrate this and we still can't integrate this for the same reason we can't integrate the previous. We want to do something like a U sub, but I don't have like some X and Y terms sitting there. Right? The cool thing that we can do is that it turns out this actually is integrable in three dimensions and it is not integrable in two dimensions. 
what you're going to see, one of the major topics of Calc 3 is going to be to think in other uh, things for integration, other, other uh, units of measurement. What you should be thinking right here, if you're a mathematician, is this looks to me like x squared plus y squared with a negative factored into it. And I know that x squared plus y squared is in polar coordinates the same thing as r squared. So what you are going to learn about in Calc 3 is you already know about converting to polar. There's my conversion to polar statement. In Calc 3, you guys are also going to see that we are going to be able to convert dx and dy into polar type statements. But the very special thing that's going to happen when you cover this section in Calc 3 is that you'll see that dx and dy don't just correspond with a dr and a d theta, r and theta being our polar coordinates. It actually is going to be equivalent to an r dr d theta. And if you want to know why, really don't worry about it for right now. It's not that hard, but it's just a, it's, that's a day of Calc 3 class right there is kind of justifying that statement. What that means is that this integral here can actually be rewritten as a double integral of e to the negative r squared r dr d theta. And you should notice that this r is what makes this integrable now. Now I can do a u sub where I let u be r squared. Then I, and let me just kind of write this right. I'm not going to like do a whole bunch of stuff right here, but it's, it's worth it to see that there's, there are just integration tricks that happen, man. Why, come on, let me scroll. Why can't I scroll? Oh man, is it really going to be like this to me now? Am I not allowed to type? Oh man, can't, come on, come on ruining it the last oh my gosh not allowed anymore huh we're no longer allowed to type in this thing I'm not looking to change font there's nothing that's happening you gotta be kidding me insert okay apparently I gotta figure out how to undo some of the keyboard buttons that are good. Okay. Oh, I'm back. All right. There we go. I'm allowed to scroll again. So the point is now I could do my u equals r squared. du is 2r dr. And I make that a 1 half du equals r dr. And I now can actually go ahead and do my integration because now I just have e to the negative u this becomes uh, du, d theta. I can now do my integration here. I get my negative e to the negative u, and then I just have to integrate with respect to theta right there, and we get it, right? So a lot. there are uh, so many integration techniques. So the cool thing about this one is that a crazy way that people actually do do this integral, even though it is technically impossible, is you extend your scenario to include another make-believe variable, which is here, the y. You then convert your scenario into being in polar. You do the integration in polar. You pop back out into x, y land, and then you re-extract your y information, and now you've integrated with respect to y. That's wild, and you should be like, what the hell? Um, but the point is, so much strange stuff happens with integration that there are a billion techniques uh, that are out there. You'll never learn all of them. Almost all of them are really cool. This is one of my favorite ones. Integrals that are not possible in 2D, but that are possible in 3D, and that the 3D counterparts actually makes the 2D part possible. That's just wild stuff right there, um, but really cool ideas. And so uh, every time I see a new integral trick, I am always like, holy crap, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I'll continue to show you guys some neat ones that are associated with this. But I feel like there's a thing worth talking about since we are going to talk about probability as an application section later this semester. And most of you guys are going to go take Math 50C and you are going to specifically talk about integration of this format, converting rectangular stuff into polar, doing integration in polar and then converting back all that kind of jazz that'll all happen later so there you go there's your bonus tony eight minutes at the end of our little lecture right here um so cool stuff really cool integration techniques that crop up places for for various purposes so um, good stuff to see so again let me just leave my final screenshot of this video um being 
your most important step for this week is to, uh, I think that this screen right here is perfect. Think about your Riemann sticks. Be able to write integrals that are directly comparable to your Riemann diagrams. Be able to make the smart choice about doing DX stuff versus DY stuff. Um, and be comfortable working in those modalities. Obviously, it's just a letter name change, so hopefully you don't feel too awkward about doing integrals of Y step DY. It's just a letter that's in there. Um, and maybe my last thing just to say, really honest last thing of the day, is you should continue to do things like indicate what variable is in your bounds of integration for the entire rest of the semester. You have seen now today that we talk about stuff being in terms of both DX and in DY, these are y bounds these are x bounds uh, over here uh, we also know that we do u sub stuff in u sub we get bounds for u next semester you guys are going to convert into r and in theta you're going to have r bounds and theta bounds you should recognize that you are now walking into a world where there are not just y's and x's and x is always the independent variable uh, it matters more that you specifically track variables all the time and so i would encourage you to rather than just writing bounds of integration and bounds of evaluation that those all start getting like x equal and y equal stuff um, organization matters and strategy matters might be like our big lesson uh, out of kind of this early stuff from this stuff here. I want you to all spend as little time as possible doing as, math, as much math as possible and being organized and uh, being strategic is the way that you're going to do that. So take those broad lessons away from this section here. Tomorrow we're going to hit up section 6.2. Uh, I'm going to try and fill it with less filler words and more math only. 6.2 is a lot going on. I am going to beg you, um, even if you watch the 6.1 video before doing the reading, uh, I shake my fist at you. You really need to come to the 6.2 video a little bit more ready because there's a lot of stuff that happens. And it's, it's one big concept that happens in 6.2, but 6.2 accumulating our volumes, there's about a hundred different ways that it could all go down. And you need to be a little bit comfortable with understanding uh, most of those before we come into this. So I think our little bit heavier lectures are 6.2.1. I'll go ahead and knock that guy out tomorrow. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to say. I still got to make some my open math homework and post that and a written homework. The written homework that I'm going to ask you to do guys this week, it's going to be like two big problems. One of them is basically going to be what you're looking at on the screen right now. The other one will be from section 6.2. I'll go ahead and get those posted, but technically I sort of feel like I shouldn't need those after I make my videos anyway. Uh, last thing I'll say, small announcement. I'll make this announcement in Canvas though also. Um, I might be on a trip next weekend. Um, technically next Monday is a day off of school. I have not really felt certain as to how much I'm supposed to acknowledge days off when I teach online and you never have to be anywhere. So it's been my plan that next Monday I was just gonna do normally, um, even though it's technically not a day of class. Uh, however, I am going on a short trip with my wife uh, for, for, the, for the long weekend. Um, it's really technically actually like a work trip for her. I might not be here on Monday. Um, in that case, I'm just going to bump the whole week sort of like Tuesday. You know, first lecture will be Tuesday. Second lecture will be Wednesday. And maybe we'll just kind of combine some office hours into Thursday, Friday to wrap up that week. So I, I'm not even 100% positive about that. If I do do it, I'll, I'll certainly send you guys a Canvas announcement. Um, so this is just my pre notice that it might be that next week we bump everything by a day since technically it is uh, Monday is no school day so I'll go ahead and wrap this up right now um, there's our there's our six one stuff right there six two I think is gonna be a little bit more hairy so I hope to see all of you guys for some six two stuff tomorrow at 1230 I'll see you guys then <laughs>